Thanks for looking at the same topic. And we're going to just uh, look at the continuation of and finish up the section of the very first layer we've been considering. So this layer here is the layer that addresses any major safety issues um, on an automa automatic day-to-day -day basis. So this is our basic level control system. We've seen this in the 3 p course, and we're comfortable with this. But in our focus here in this class is to find which loops do we pair so that we have safe operations. So what do I manipulate in order to control a certain measurement or a certain flow or a certain temperature or pressure? What can I manipulate in order to keep that within the safe bound? Or at, I should say, let's say, keep it at a set point. Then there's going to be some sort of upper bound beyond which we really don't want to go. And if we do go above that, though, that's where we're going to raise an alarm. So we're going to look at alarms today after finishing off our study first of the basic control system. So basic control systems have several components. Let's recall from the 3P course and from your knowledge of process control, what makes up a control loop? What elements do we need? in a control loop. So if someone says we need to put a control loop in place, what are all the things you're going to have to put together to get that control loop working? Uh, the measurement, uh, transmitter. Okay, so measurement, transmitter. So this is the guy that's measuring a particular variable you want to control. So if you want to control temperature, you need to measure temperature in some way. So that measurement, that's the first thing we need. Yeah? I forgot, I don't know what it's called, but you know if you have temperature and you measure it in degrees and then you convert it to a voltage? Okay, so that converter. So let's let's wrap that all up into this single unit, which for the most part is an off-the-shelf device that you can purchase. Yeah. What else would we need? <laughs> well, we want to make a list of what we need because we want to figure out next, in this section of the course, what's going to go wrong. So if we've got a whole list of things we need, any one of those could go wrong. Yes, we need a controller. You need the controller, so that refers to like some digital device. <coughs> or so the controller itself. So this is the, the computer chip or the computer software that will perform the PI algorithm. Indicator for... So the sensor, yeah. So measurement, transmitter, sensor, Several ways one can interpret that. Yeah. The algorithm system will actually change that variable, so it could be like trigger valve to let it more steam or more flow rate or whatever. Maybe. Okay, so usually a valve, or what you'll often see in process control called the final control element, this is the manipulated variable that's going to adjust. Okay, so this could fail as well. The controller could fail, the measurement transmitter could fail. What else would we do? <coughs> And so if I purchase those three things, do I have a control loop? What else? The connections between them. Connections. <coughs> and what form do they take? Wires. So they're usually electrical wiring. Modern day plants, they'd be wireless. So you need all sorts of wireless equipment in your plants. And if you're looking at plants, from 1990s and prior, that may be pneumatic. So we're using small pipes of compressed air to convey our signals around. So electrical, pneumatic, and modern plant wires. Okay, so any one of those elements can go wrong. Is there anything else that we might need? Right, so those interfaces between the old style technology, pneumatic, and the electric wire. Okay. So P to I converters. The other thing we need is, it seems weird to say this, but we need electricity. Right, if our power fails, our control loop fails. Okay. So multiple elements in the control loop, multiple things can go wrong. 
the reliability of each one of these is extremely high. So we perform maintenance on our electrical supply to our plants, make sure that that never fails. Like we, we have very, very high reliability of that. Our connections, short of people driving into wires with their forklifts or cutting wires inadvertently in a plant, those have pretty high reliability. Valves, 99.9% .9 plus reliability. Each one of those elements, they're very, very high with reliability. Put them in series though, then the whole circuit is only as strong as the weakest one, right? So we need, we find the lowest reliability of these elements and that's going to give us our overall control of reliability because these are put in series. Multiply that by a thousand control loops in the plant and you can quickly see that the chances of something going wrong within a given year are actually quite high. Okay, so one loop going wrong within a year, very, very low probability, but a typical process control plant is a thousand control loops quite easily. So the chances of something happening that we don't like is quite high. Okay, so this is what we're going to focus on over the next uh, next while. Um, and in later classes, we'll actually quantify that reliability. So we were looking last class then at this basic process control system. And recall we had said at the end of the class, we had come to this discussion where we had said the most effective loops to control here are control that level here in the bottom of the flash drum by manipulating this valve position open and close. So we had a, fa a fairly long discussion on that and the fact that this is an unstable variable and that's the need for, for the control over there. We would also say that that pressure up there at the top of the column is a variable that changes very rapidly. And to, to keep this flash drum safe, we don't want to go to regions of high pressure and exceed the pressure rating for that vessel. So to control that pressure, we need to manipulate that valve position F5 to let out material that we need. We could have also looked at some of the other control loops on this uh, on this diagram, but these two here, the level and the pressure, are the two key variables that affect safety. The other control loops will affect throughput to the process. So, for example, the throughput into the column um, can be adjusted by by valve V3 that will increase or decrease my flow into another column. But that's not necessarily a safety variable. I could also adjust this sensor, uh, sorry, this uh, analyzer value down here. So this is the purity of the stream. A1 is a composition analyzer. That can be adjusted by varying the temperature in the column. So if you increase the temperature in the column, you change the vapor-liquid equilibrium, and changing the vapor-liquid equilibrium will alter how much material you send as vapor and which molecules get sent down to liquid. Okay? So this purity of the stream, what is the composition, of that can be adjusted by column temperature. So that's a standard, those are standard loop pairings we see in the industry. But uh, we're looking only at safety. So very fast variables, pressure need to be controlled, and in this case, unstable variables level need to be controlled. So that was our discussion last time. Then we ended off the class by the, with this example, asking, well, we've got this exothermic reaction taking place. So a pack bed reactor, and I'm feeding my feed into it, exothermic reaction takes place, heat is generated, and leaves out of the, out of the, out of the reactor. I measure the temperature over here, and I happen to control that outlet temperature by manipulating the valve opening on a parallel, feed of cold, uh, a parallel stream of cold feed. My feed rate, then, I can adjust this temperature of this blend coming into the reactor by opening and closing that valve by altering the inlet temperature, I'm effectively able to control the outlet temperature. So that was our discussion last class. We ended off there, and I'd asked the question, what happens if TC breaks? What if that temperature sensor breaks? So this is essentially asking this question. This guy fails. So we still have our system, we still have our connections, we still have our valves, we still have our controller, but this measurement sensor breaks. What can we do? First, we, we answered last class what happens, right? What was the answer to that question? What happens if temperature sensor breaks and reads zero degrees Celsius? Oh, sorry. 
the appropriate signal is not sent to that bar. The, the temperature sensor reads zero, so it reads low. So normally there will be a high temperature in here. Now we've suddenly got this low reading of temperature. The control loop's action is to immediately close or open that valve? Close. close. So causing the stream entering now to be warmer than it would have otherwise been, we're still releasing heat and we set up a positive feedback loop that can potentially spiral out of control. We don't want that to happen, so what do we do? What do you do on the morning when you wake up for a job interview that's at 8 a.m.? Two alarms. Two alarms, or three alarms. <laughs> and you have your friend phone you, maybe your mom as well. Okay, so same thing here. Loops that are critical, we put on a second instrument, a second temperature sensor. And we have a selector or some sort of computer logic shown here with the symbol with a greater than sign indicating find the input or pick the input with the largest temperature. That's the one we're going to read. Okay? So we don't, uh, we don't, if T1 breaks and now read zero degrees, we're still going to use T2 to control our loop. We're also going to send an alarm to the operator and say, by the way, there's this huge discrepancy between T1 and T2. Take a look at this, please. So we're going to do that as well. But in the meantime, this automatic control loop needs to keep going. It's running every one second, every two seconds. We're going to use, in the meantime, just the higher of the two until operators or human interaction come in to fix up that discrepancy. So whenever we have these issues of potential failure and reliability of either the, the measurement sensor, the controller, the valve, our standard approach is to put on a second Okay. So if, we, if we're concerned that our valve may fail, we can instrument put in uh, parallel feeds with two valves. If we're concerned our sensor is going to fail, we put in two sensors. Nuclear industry will often put three aircraft, three or five sensors, okay? and they pick the best three out of five to control on. So control loops that absolutely cannot fail on us, we put on greater and greater level of redundancy. And then have a voting system in place where we vote and say pick, pick the sensors that agree most with each other and it's a democratic decision that gets used in control. So that's the, the principle there. Let's take a look at what happens now when valves fail. Okay, so let's, let's try to understand what this, what this issue is about. Okay? Controllers very seldom fail. Okay, we do regular maintenance on our computer systems there. Our connections, though they can fail, okay, if the operator is driving to the electric wiring with a forklift or our wireless router shuts down. Okay, so those are things that we also need to monitor for. But let's take a look at some of the more mechanical things on our process, the valves. If the operator drives into the pneumatic connection, so these are small pipes that carry compressed air around your plants and send the signals to the valves to tell them how much to open and close by. So we're, we're talking 1960s, 1970s technology, which you will likely see. Okay, not to say that you're only ever going to see these two in practice, you will almost certainly see pneumatic style valves still. Let's take a look at, at how they work. So the signal this compressed air signal comes in over here. So there's my compressed air coming in. And this valve has a spring over here. And that spring's tendency is to push down. Okay, so if there's little, low, low pressure over here, or no pressure, so little or no pressure coming in here, that spring is pushing down, the valve is closed. If I increase the flow of pressure, so my, in other words, my control loop, my PI algorithm tells the controller to send a signal to open the valve, it will send a greater pressure. That pressure coming in over here will start to counteract that spring's force opening the valve to a, to a point where that valve is 100% open. Right? So there's a certain maximum valve position, 100% open, is when that pressure exceeds the force of the spring and fully opens the valve. 
Now your forklift operator comes along, drives into this tube, breaks the pneumatic airline, and now it's open to atmosphere. So this pressure signal coming in here is now zero or atmospheric. That valve will shut, fully closed, and it's what we call a fail closed valve, FC. So next to valve symbols on PI drawings in your project, you will indicate the valve's direction of failure. Will it fail closed or will it fail open? So a fail open valve works in the same principle, just in the opposite manner. This time the spring is charged so that the valve is fully open when there's no pressure or low pressure coming in here. Little or no pressure, this valve will be fully open. As that pressure signal comes in and becomes higher and higher, it counteracts the spring, closing the valve. But otherwise, the valve fails in an open position. So FO or FC. Here's a Different style drawing for the same principle. Let's take a look again at the fail open valve. Here's my spring. Its tendency is to lift up, so keeping this, this open over here, allowing fluid to keep flowing through the valve. As that air pressure increases, it counteracts the spring closing the valve. But it will fail open. So we'll see the terminology as normally open or fail open. The normally closed valve is exactly that. It will, in the absence of any air coming in there, it will be in a closed position. So that valve will seat all the way down and close the circuit, allowing no flow. So given those two valve types, have a quick discussion amongst yourselves. For these four, five valves here, so we've got one, two, three, Five, uh, four and five valves here. For each one of them, decide should they fail open or should they fail closed. Half, half. 
and saying open. Okay, valve should fail open. Why? We don't want this build up of pressure occurring. If there's a plant failure, we want to let that pressure out of the drum. We don't want to have a pressurized vessel beyond our level. Yeah. So we're going to see mechanisms later where we can relieve pressure should it build up. But in a, in a situation where there's loss of, of that power, let's say the operator just breaks that single line on its own, we want that valve to fail in a position which causes the least amount of damage to us and the environment. And that's in the open position so it can keep moving out and, and not leave a pressurized state here in this vessel. V4, the level controller. Should it fail open or closed? Open? Closed? Anyone closed? No? Okay, open as well for the same, for similar reasons. If this valve failed closed, we would have a potential where this feed still coming in is going to build up a level that's going to rise and rise into this vessel and then overflow into the vapor stream. And the vapor stream is not intended to have liquid. So downstream from that, we're not expecting liquid. Uh, recall back again, this is similar to the BP Texas City incident where we've got a vessel filling up with liquid and it's not intended to go beyond that height. So valve V4 should fail open as well. V3, fail closed or open? Closed. Okay. Failure on the process, let's not fill this drum up here. Let's stop that flow into that vessel. V2 and V1, similar, similar principle. There are controlling flows on the utility side of the heat exchanger. Open or closed? If they fail, let's ask the question this way. If they fail open, what's going to occur? Okay, so think of usual operation. Where would these valve positions be? Under normal steady state, beautiful operation, V1 and V2, where would they be? Would they be at 0%? Would they be at 100%? Somewhere in the middle, right? So they're controlling heat to this feed stream coming in. So they're heating up the stream. This is a, this is a, you recall from the previous slide, this is a hot fluid stream, this is a hot steam. Both are coming in and exchanging heat and heating up this feed. So if they say, let's say at 60% at operation, both of them normally at 60% and there's a failure, <coughs> should they go to 100% or should they go to zero? Yeah. Zero, right? The safest position for them to fail in is in a position where they're not exchanging heat. Now we're sending temperature in here that's lower than we would have expected. We're not going to produce good quality product, but we're going to be safe, safer. Okay. So fail open, fail close. Think of it in terms of those. That yes. For you too, because the valve is on the right side of the exchanger, we should not be worried about building up pressure inside the exchanger. Yes. Or the, just reach the, the fact that it's it's on this side or that side doesn't matter too much because you're stopping the flow. So there's it's just flow that's not going anywhere. Okay, so we're going to see why this valve is l later on. It's just from an operation point of view that it's done, but from a, it's not doing anything which is point too much. <coughs> I would argue that this valve should also be done there, but uh, it's just this drawing is drawn incorrectly. But um, We'll, we'll come to that in a later class. Okay, so that that discussion then gives us, wraps up this section on basic process control. So our basic process control is there, not only as you learned in 3P, you, when you learned about process control loops, you've learned that we want to get to our set point nice and smoothly in a short amount of time. That addresses point four. That's not the only reason for control loops existence. Um, Point four and five and six are, usual, are the reasons you most often to now have considered control loops. But control loops are also here for the safety aspect and protecting the environment and protecting our equipment. Okay, so here we saw in this flash drum example, we protected the environment and the people around it. In this unit over here, we've got a packed bed. 
you can argue that this controller bed is also protecting the equipment because if this packed bed exceeded a certain maximum temperature, we could start to degrade our catalyst. And those catalysts are extremely expensive. So we're trying to protect the equipment in our process as well with that control. So when we we're looking at control loops, we have to bear in mind that the loop can fail in at several particular points. And we've looked at the measurements failing and the valve failing. So we're going to then go to the next section on alarms. So alarms then address the, uh, the point where that sensor is not, or the control loop, I should say, let's come back here, the, the control loop in, its, in all its totality is not able to keep us close to the set point. And we start to reach some sort of upper level. Okay? What happens in those instances? We're going to look at that next. Before we do that, though, I just take a few minutes, please, to fill out the evaluation that you have in front of you. Give you five minutes or so. Um, I appreciate this feedback so that I can make improvements to the course. Otherwise, I have to wait till next year, and then you guys don't get any better. So let's, uh, let's take a look here at alarms then. So there's a bit of a detail here. Alarms, the key differentiator with alarms compared to the previous section is that when we raise an alarm, there's no action that's taken by the alarm. So the alarm system is purely a, a mechanism, as it says, to alert the operator that there's a problem. But there's no further automatic action taken by that system. So for example, that system will not shut down part of the process, or it will not open valves, it will not start pumps, close pumps, there's no automatic action on the process by the alarm, other than a signal to the control room. Okay? If there is an action, then it's really something that could have been done in a, in a feedback control loop, or as we'll see in the next section with the safety interlock system. So there's no, the key distinction between this layer below it and the layer above it, those, the layer below and above, they have some action that's taken. In this layer here in the middle, the, the control loop or the electronics do not take any action. A person must take action. And the reason is, the person must take action because the action may be different depending on the context <coughs> of the alarm. So same alarm today compared to the alarm, that same alarm the next week, the action taken by the operator will be different or could be different. If that case exists, that's when we have an alarm and not an automatic action. An order, <clears throat> automatic action should be taken when it's the same action is taken for the same alarm. Then that's something that you would instrument and make automatic. But if the action to be taken is different depending on the context, then an alarm is appropriate. Yes. What is the scope of the alarm for an operator? Are they engineers or? What is the scope of, in, of the, what is the knowledge of an operator? High school education. That's typical. Would would we depend on their knowledge to change the operation of control? Do we rely on their knowledge Should to take control and action on the process? We should have procedures and training developed by engineers. Right. So they follow procedures and training that we've developed for them. What if something comes up that's so they have to have an engineer to put on there? Okay. What if something comes up that's different? They should be going through emergency scenario training. They do go through emergency scenario training. We'll, I'll show you a video of that. And then they should have like an engineer supervisor or there should be someone there that is a... There's someone there that's normally either in the room physically or very quickly available. Okay, so our role as engineers is often to be called in at very short notice to solve a problem that's beyond the operator's level of understanding. But it is surprising to me still that we have these very sophisticated systems which we study four or five years and have multiple uh, training on ourselves and we're handing those over to people <coughs> that have le far less training, right? So it's not to say that they're not competent, it's just that they're very different background with training. So that you don't come with this analytical way of thinking that we often would come to a problem with, okay? But there's procedures set in place for them to follow. So absolutely, we'll, we'll actually try and simulate an alarm situation ourselves in this course in two tutorials um, near the end. We'll, we'll sort of simulate this. My other advice to you, and I, I think I said this to one of the tutorial groups on, on Monday, is 
I highly recommend that when you start working, you sit in an operator's control room for a few days and work with them and see what it's really like to be there. Right? It's a tough, tough job, and it's not obvious that, um, how to make those decisions. Uh, it's really, re it, your insight into a process develops far faster that way than sitting at your desk looking at the flow sheet. So, key thing about alarms is there's no action. The other thing is just more of a side point is that we will record those and preferably <coughs> they should be recorded off site. Any disaster that you've seen happen, we want to be able to recreate that disaster later on to learn from it. And it's no good if the system that's storing our alarms has been blown up. And so we want to keep that off site or at least in a, in a mechanism that we can get to it after the bad event has happened. Um, we should also record sensor failures, we've mentioned that before, but we'll see here that alarms are used as well in this, uh, sorry, sensors are used to set up the alarm. And so to trigger an alarm, we need a sensor to make a measurement. Okay, so if, we're, if there's a temperature that's too high, and that temperature is also in a feedback control loop, remember what we said about independent layers. So here's a temperature that's used in a feedback control loop, but we also want to make sure that that temperature doesn't exceed some high level. What do we do to keep independence? We buy two temperature sensors. Right? One temperature sensor is for the feedback control loop, the other temperature sensor is for the alarm to maintain that level of independence between the two layers. It's no good if you have one temperature sensor going to the alarm and that same signal going to the feedback control loop. Because if the sensor should fail, then you don't have either of those two layers in place anymore. Okay, so very important that we keep those two layers separately, with separate instrumentation and separate wiring. Okay, so that coming back to this, in a control loop we have a, a measurement and all these other things. For an alarm we have a measurement and we have connections and electricity. We also make sure that these are on separate circuits. So the electrical circuit running your feedback control loop is not the same electrical circuit that's running your alarm system. Okay, so Dr. Marlin's story is that he's worked at ESSO for many years prior to come to MAC. And in one of his jobs there, one of the junior engineers walked into the control room and was shown, oh, this is our, this is our control system. And by the way, this is the switch that controls everything. And the student proceeded to just unplug the thing and everything shut down, the control system shut down. The, so like there's, and as he says, that student had a very short life at the company. But <laughs> the point is that there needs to be this independence. The, the electrical circuit running your control loops is not the same electrical circuit. It's not the same computer system that's running your alarms. Sounds trivial to say it now, but work for any small company, the cost of purchasing two systems versus one, when the same system can do both, because the, the supplier of the system sells it to you, look at our, our control software. It does control loops and it does a lot. So you think, great, I can buy one computer and we'll do both things. But what you've essentially done is you've taken away that independence between the two layers. So be, be, be aware of that. Uh, so, yeah. so question, would we solve that problem when we send another sensor and we'll see the greater? So in that case, we'll have three sensors, yeah. two for the uh, greater and then the third one for the alarm. Absolutely. So coming, yeah, so that's a good question. So here in this issue, those two sensors are for the control loop alone. If you needed a temperature for the alarm system, it's a third T3. Okay, now temperature sensors aren't very much money, $1,000. So, okay, so and cheap is still sometimes. But again, compare that with the cost of replacing a $20 million catalyst bed and a reactor that's probably costing a similar amount of money. So we, 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 we spend more money, but there's a reason for it. And we, we don't, what I don't want you to take away from this, we don't go do this on every control loop in our process either. Right? It's only those that, that cause significant safety and environmental and economic damage. Wouldn't, isn't at some level, usually you're, like at some, like at any operating room, isn't the computer that like the operators are looking at the same thing that gets moving on? Like even if they you want to separate the alarm system, at some point it has to go to the same level. So that visual display, yeah, that could shut down if, you, if there's a loss of power. But the 
control loops would fire a separate safety system with their own backup power. The alarm system is on its own electrical supply. Right, so it's not that if you unplug one plug, the whole yeah. system shuts down. It's a talking separate circuit breakers, separate uninterruptible power supplies. Okay, and, and the visual display is, is cosmetic, right? But the, the system that runs those loops should still keep operating. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at how an alarm works. The general principle is quite simple in the time domain. We're, we're comfortable with this. Here's my sensor measurement. Um, let's say it's temperature, and it exceeds the alarm limit. So this dashed red line is the alarm limit. The moment that sensor reaches that limit, we have two things occur. We create a sound in the control room. So that sound goes from nothing to something. So we turn on some portable alarm, and we also turn on a visual display, a light that's blinking. So this light is there flashing for the operator's attention, and there's an audible sound. Because our operators are not looking at the system all the time, right? They could be turning their back, talking to their colleague, so there's the audible alarm to alert them, and then there's the visual alarm as well to draw their attention to which alarm it is. So audible alarm will go off for every alarm. You may have different sounds if you if you Again, but in general, it's the same sound for any alarm. The light will flash for a particular alarm. The operator will then acknowledge the alarm. They push a button and say, okay, I know that this is a problem. But they don't, this doesn't mean they take an action. This just simply says, I'm cognizant of the fact that something's gone wrong. So that turns the sound off so that it's a little quiet in the control room and also makes the light blink, I uh, stop blinking but it's still lit. So the light is on, but not blinking anymore. Because this problem still exists. So as long as this is above that limit, that light will stay on. The operator can take some manual action. They bring this variable back below the limit. That light will automatically turn off. There's no further automatic action. So notice here that the control system, or the alarm system takes no action. This action to bring this down was action implemented by the operator. Multiply this by 500 potential alarm circuits on a, on a company system. There's a potential for many alarms per hour. Okay, so what we do is that we, we classify alarms into low, medium, and high priority so that the operator can know where to address their attention. Should two or three alarms occur simultaneously, and that's fairly typical, right? If a problem happens, the temperature exceeds, the pressure probably also exceeds, so two things could be going on. We have ranked them as low priority, medium priority, and high priority. Okay, so low priority would be things that we can go look at later on. You could almost argue that that shouldn't be an alarm that needs to be acknowledged. It should just be a record that's made. But then medium and high priority, these are issues that lead to loss of money, loss of economics in the process, and hazardous situations. Okay, so. There's obviously, you all know the story of Crying Wolf. If you don't know the story of Crying Wolf, you can go look it up and read the story of Crying Wolf. But you create too many alarms that when there is an alarm that actually is the problem, then people don't pay attention to it. So take a look at this. Now this is a simulation. This is used for training. We've, we've spoken about earlier how our operators are trained. This is the training that's done in a nuclear reactor facility in New York. done for operators to train them on a nuclear facility when things go wrong. So we don't see this on a normal basis. But the principle I wanted to just point out here is notice those alarms up there, they were flashing and they're different colors, red, orange, and then you know, this sort of a lighter yellow. 
indicating a different ranking for the operators. They also have them labeled as A, B, C, D, E, so those potentially would be different sections of the plant that they're referring to. Okay. The other thing is, think of this in your career as an engineer, because you're ultimately the people that are responsible for designing the layout of what's shown here. How much information is coming through the system at every given point in time? We have to be fairly selective of what we show here to our operators so that what is shown is enough for them to make a decision, but not so much to be overwhelming. And that's that's a challenge for us as engineers. So bear that in mind, we'll continue on with the topic of alarms. Um, on the